Uh, Our next scripture this morning comes from the 13th chapter of the book of Acts. And uh, there's uh, a number of personal names and place names, but try to hang with it as I read it to you. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John also to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they met a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man who summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. But the magician, Illimus, for that is the translation of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. And now listen, the hand of the Lord is against you, and you will be blind for a while, unable to see the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he went about groping for someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem. We pause the story here. Um, I'm not going to read the next scripture for a while, so I'm just telling you that so you don't get anxious and think I forgot. Okay? So I'm going to read it to you in a while. At the funeral of former president George Herbert Walker Bush on December 5th, his son described his father as someone who served in the Oval Office with dignity and integrity and said that even in defeat, his father was able to teach his children lessons. He said he accepted failure as part of living a full life but taught us never to be defined by failure. He showed us how setbacks can strengthen. Well, the truth is, life is full of failures and disappointments and setbacks, so we might as well be prepared to accept them, to learn from them without being crushed by them. And that's why it's very important that we learn, the sooner the better, that one failure or even a hundred and one failures, that doesn't mean that we are a failure. In the passage that I read to you from Acts chapter 13, we hear about three very important people. And their names are Barnabas, Paul, who's formerly known as Saul, and John, who's also known as Mark. I'm sorry for the confusion, but I didn't write the book. (laughs) Barnabas was given the name, that name, which means son of encouragement by the early church because of his generosity of spirit. Barnabas was somebody who we would describe as being people-oriented. He was the kind of person who was generous with his love, with his time, and he gave of himself relentlessly, to help other people. Saul was a very different person than Barnabas. Saul had been persecuting Christians, throwing them into jail, 
even approving of mob violence against believers. And amazingly, Saul has an experience on the road to Damascus with the risen Christ, and his life is completely turned around, but he had a problem. Not a single Christ follower wanted anything to do with him. They didn't, they didn't trust him. They didn't believe he had changed. No one wanted anything to do with him. Now, this is the person who would go on to write more of the New Testament than any other single individual. So how did that happen? How did he go from being a distrusted outcast, an enemy of the church, to its most determined advocate and its most prolific writer? Well, it happened because one person stepped in. One person stepped in and put his reputation and his life on the line for Saul and opened the doors to trust, to community, to belonging, and to service. When nobody else would do it. And as my mother used to say, I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count who that person was. Barnabas. So Barnabas and Paul, long before Batman and Robin, were a dynamic duo. Barnabas brought his generosity of spirit, his encouragement, and his passion for developing people. Saul, on the other hand, was task-oriented, driven, hard-working, well-educated, and intense. Both of them were men of prayer who fasted regularly and sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And they complemented each other very, very well, and God used them greatly. So that brings us to the passage I read for you already, not the next one. In Acts 13, verse 1, they're at Antioch, and that church in Antioch had this incredible and diverse leadership team. There are prophets and teachers there, including two black men, Simeon, a Levite from Cyprus, and Lucius from North Africa. There's Menaean, who was a boyhood friend or a foster brother of Herod Antipas, the ruler of that area, as well as Barnabas and Saul, who was a former Pharisee. And while they're worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit directs them to set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. And so they set out. And we're told in a very easy-to-miss phrase at the end of Acts 13, verse 5, that they had John also to assist them. That's that John Mark. Well, John, who is also known as Mark, is a young man who at different points was a companion of Barnabas, of Paul, and of Peter. So in Acts chapter 12, for example, in verse 12, we learn that John Mark is the son of a woman who, like every other woman in the New Testament, is named Mary. And again, I didn't write the book. I'm sorry for the confusion. But he's the son of a woman named Mary, and it's in Mary's house in Jerusalem that Christians from those earliest days met to pray. And so it was to this house that Peter went after his miraculous escape from prison. That's recalled in Acts chapter 12 and verses 6 to 18. And later on, Mark accompanied Paul and Barnabas on a journey from Antioch to Jerusalem with famine relief aid. So Mark is a young man who is already connected to some of the most influential leaders of the Jesus movement. I mean, he is on the fast track to being a leader himself, it appears. But something goes wrong. And we're not told the reason why. We don't know if he got sick, if he got scared, if there was a family emergency, if he felt overwhelmed, if there was a disagreement about theology or philosophy of ministry or strategy or tactics or goals. But for some reason, Mark quits the mission. And he decided to walk away and leave Barnabas and Paul in the middle of their missionary journey. Now, I don't need to tell you, but you know that means I'm going to tell you anyway. I don't need to tell you that quitting isn't good. Quitting 
walking away is rarely the God-honoring thing to do. It can sometimes feel like the easier path, but conflicts and disagreements rarely get settled that way. And we rarely mature as followers of Christ that way. And we don't know what happened. As I said, all we know is that John left them and returned to Jerusalem. John Mark, in my take, had failed. He had the privilege of serving with two of the best leaders in the early church, and he let them down and he abandoned them. He didn't see the race through to its end. He didn't persevere when it got hard. And I wonder how he felt when he got home to Jerusalem. What was his mental, his physical, his emotional state? Can you picture him? What may have been going on? I won't speak for you, I'll speak for myself and say that when I have failed, which happens often, I have to be careful not to get into what I call a negative loop. And a negative loop, maybe you'll see if it's, you relate to this at all, a negative loop can go something like this. Our confidence gets shaken. And when our confidence is shaken, then we're less sure of ourselves. And when we become less sure of ourselves, then we become more fearful, more afraid, more defensive. And then we tend to assume the worst, often about ourselves and about other people. We're less likely to trust ourselves or to trust others. And we become less likely to take risks. And then we become ashamed and we we become embarrassed and we start to worry about, well, what are other people going to think? And we often think people are thinking about us a lot more than they actually are. Do you think it's possible that John Mark might be feeling some of this, given his circumstance? And I try to imagine, because when you read and study the scripture, you want to use your imagination. You want to use your senses. So I try to picture, what does John look like as he walks back into his mother's house? without Barnabas, without Paul. I can almost see his mother Mary like coming into the front room and, hey, welcome home. Where's the rest of the team? And I bet she knew instantly what had happened. Now Mary was clearly a woman of deep faith. She's a recognized leader herself. And as a parent, any of us who have children, when our children experience a failure, we feel worse for them than if it was our own failure. We would prefer that it was our own rather than them having to go through it. And I wonder if Mark's mother Mary looked at her son's head hanging down, his drooping shoulders, the way he was averting his eyes and not able to look into her eyes for long, And I wonder if she knew she had to remind her son of some important spiritual truths. And I wonder if she told him again the story about Jesus. How he loved everyone, even and especially those that the self-righteous and the powerful and the rich looked down upon as the losers and the undesirables and the failures. How Jesus listened to and talked to all kinds of people and how through his humility and love, He enabled so many people to experience forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation and freedom. How so many people came to Jesus looking and feeling like Mark did at this moment of coming home and yet left his presence feeling love and hope and the transforming power to live a changed and a renewed life. All that was required was to trust Jesus, to trust what he said was true, and to live it. And even as he was being crucified, Jesus forgave those who were carrying out his execution. And perhaps Mary told her son, if Jesus could forgive 
even that, He can certainly forgive your failures and mine. But while John Mark was back in Jerusalem, back at home, Barnabas and Saul spent about a year on the road on their missionary journey. And that's when we get to our next scripture at Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and set out the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This brief passage is both sobering and encouraging at the same time. It's sobering because two friends and partners in ministry with the spiritual maturity of Barnabas and Saul can have such a sharp disagreement that they decide to part company. And there's part of me that's discouraged by that. It's like the failure of John Mark has multiplied. And now it has ruptured a friendship and a ministry team. And if ministry giants like Barnabas and Saul can't get along and resolve their differences, what hope is there for the rest of us? Thankfully, that's not the end of the story. I just wanted to let that sit there for a moment. Thankfully, that's not the end of the story. Because remember what I told you at the beginning about Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas is generous of spirit, he's people-oriented, and he invests in other people when other folks won't give them a chance. Saul, task-oriented, driven, high expectations of himself and others. And the irony of the dispute between Barnabas and Paul is that Paul can't see that what Barnabas wants to offer to John Mark is exactly the same opportunity that Barnabas had given to Paul. To open the doors to trust, belonging, community, and service. And while Saul greatly appreciated that opportunity for himself, he didn't have the grace the humility, or the love to extend it to John Mark. And again, I can imagine the conversation between Barnabas and Paul. And I can hear Barnabas, because he's a people guy, I can hear him pleading with Paul, saying, Paul, failure is a part of life. Even though we wish it weren't. And failure can be very helpful in our growth and our development if we learn from it. Failure is a detour. It's not a dead-end street. Failure is simply the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. Failure is a success if we learn from it, Paul. But whatever Barnabas said, he couldn't get Paul to extend to John Mark the same grace he welcomed for himself. And so the two great leaders split up. And Paul took Silas with him and set out Barnabas went and got John Mark and brought him back into serving under his gracious leadership and mentorship. And Acts 15, 39, that I read for you a couple minutes ago now, that's the last mention of John Mark in the book of Acts. And so you might wonder, what happened? How did the story end? Was Paul right to leave him and to think that he didn't have the right stuff and that he'd just fail and quit again? Well, I'm happy to tell you 
that Barnabas was right and Paul was wrong. And while we never hear about him again in the book of Acts, when we look at the rest of the New Testament, we discover a couple really interesting clues. Paul mentions Mark as one of the five Christians who are with him who sent greetings to Philemon and the other recipients of that brief letter. And if this is the same Mark, and I believe it is, it indicates a later reconciliation between Paul and John Mark. Isn't that awesome? That whatever had transpired that had caused Mark to leave Barnabas and Paul, whatever hard feelings there may have been between Paul and Mark, Barnabas and the Holy Spirit facilitated a beautiful work of reconciliation and grace so that John, Mark, and Paul were able to serve together effectively. And those same five Christians who are mentioned in the letter to Philemon are also among the group that sends greeting to the, to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, where Mark is identified as, in quotes, a cousin of Barnabas. And you know what I wonder about that? I wonder if they knew that because they did Ancestry.com. I wonder if they were actually blood relatives or if by then Mark was known as a cousin of Barnabas because he had been so developed and mentored that he was now an encourager and a trusted leader himself. Mark is also identified by the author of 2 Timothy in chapter 4, verse 11, as very useful in serving me. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Mark is referred to as my son. According to Christian tradition, the gospel of Mark is written by the man who took down Peter's account of, his experience, of Peter's experience with Christ. Here in New England, we appreciate a good comeback. And few people have one as good as John Mark. Here's a young man who goes from being on the fast track of Christian leadership development with two of the very best in the early church, Barnabas and Saul, and he goes from that down to the pit of despair after failing and returning to his mother's house. And to make matters worse, he had to have felt responsible for splitting up the friendship and the partnership of Barnabas and Paul. And yet notice how good God is. God takes the mess created by people and we are really good at creating messes. And God takes the mess created by people, and rather than allowing it to divide and to hurt the church, God redeems it and turns it into an opportunity for learning and growth for everyone who's a part of it. Splitting up Paul and Barnabas for a time leads to two effective ministry teams instead of just one. Paul and Silas go on and do great things for God that we hear about throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Barnabas helps to encourage and develop John Mark so he's able to reunite him with Paul, who will call him very useful, and with Peter, who will call him my son. One failure doesn't mean you're a failure. When a mistake has been made, we need to own up to it. We need to humble ourselves and learn from it. As C.S. Lewis wrote, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. If you were to start where you are today, what can you do to change the ending? in a relationship, in a place where you may have experienced or are experiencing failure? How might the Holy Spirit work in and through you if you would be willing to humble yourself and give the Holy Spirit 
a chance. Let's pray. Lord, give us the courage to fail. For if we have failed, at least we have tried. And help us to remember that failure is not an identity. It is merely an event that we can learn and grow from. Help us not to confuse a single defeat with final defeat. Remind us that failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Failure is delay. It is not defeat. It's a temporary detour. It's not a dead end. Failure is something we can avoid only by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. If there exists no possibility of failure, then victory is meaningless. Remind us that often when we think we're at the end of something, we're actually at the beginning of something else. So, Lord, help us to dare to do great things in your name, and may we not be afraid to fail. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.